from the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal. This is Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Hello and welcome to Free Expression from the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal. I'm Jerry Baker, editor at large of the journal. If you're not already a subscriber to Free Expression, please sign up at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you do your listening. This week, Democrats claim victory in the handful of off-year elections across the country on Tuesday. But is the party really poised for success in 2024? A succession of key state polls shows Joe Biden losing to Donald Trump next year. The president's approval ratings remain in the basement, and a large majority of voters say they're unhappy with the direction of the country. But the Democrats did make advances this week in Virginia State House elections and held on to the governorship of Kentucky, a state Donald Trump won by a huge margin in 2020. And voters in red state Ohio approved a constitutional amendment guaranteeing a right to an abortion in yet another big win for Democrats on an issue that seems likely to loom large next year. So what is actually the outlook for the Democratic Party, both in the immediate future and beyond? Well, I'm joined this week by Ray Teixeira, a political scientist who's made a career and a reputation studying Democratic voters. With his co-author, John Judas, he wrote a seminal book in 2002 called The Emerging Democratic Majority, which argued that demographic and other factors were evolving in a way that would cement a big electoral advantage for Democrats. But in the last year or two, he's been arguing that Democrats have lost their way. And in a new book, also written with John Judas, titled Where Have All the Democrats Gone?, He says that Democrats have lost touch with their once core working class voters by promoting economic policies that harm those voters and espousing cultural values on issues such as race and gender that alienate them. To share it and Judas say, Democrats need to press economic reforms that benefit the working and middle classes, but they need to declare a truce and find a middle ground in today's culture war so they can again become the party of the people. And Roy Teixeira joins me now. Roy, thank you very much indeed for joining Free Expression. Hey, thanks for having me, Jerry. So I want to get on to your new book written with your co-author, John Judas, Where Have All the Democrats Gone? Essentially, What's Going Wrong with the Democratic Party? But I want to start, if we may, very topically, with what seems to have at least gone right for the Democratic Party, at least this week. And they had these pretty good results in, admittedly, a very small handful of off-year elections. But Kentucky and Virginia doing well in the governor's race and in the assembly races there. And then, of course, the big vote in Ohio, the Constitution abortion. So how do you rate the state of the Democratic Party at the moment, given that? We've seen obviously some bad opinion polls for Joe Biden, but when voters actually go to the polls, as they did last November, the Democrats seem to do rather better. Yeah, well, leaving aside the issue from last November of the incredibly bad quality of a lot of the Republican candidates, I do think it's consistent with what we saw on Tuesday, which is that, and Nate Cohn has written about this, the Democrats are now sort of seem to be morphing into low turnout election specialists. <laughs> they do the best when the, the type of voters who show up are the more engaged, more committed, and of course, the more educated, where they now dominate. So this is really redounded to their benefit in these off-year and off-off-year and special elections. What the polling tells you is, at least at this point, among a broader sector of the electorate, the Democrats do not look so good. And all the things that we talked about in in the book, where have all the Democrats gone, are still quite pertinent to understanding the Democrats' chances in that broader electoral context. But yeah, I mean, (laughs) basically the worst thing that happened for the Democrats these days is to be in a high turnout election because it draws in all the peripheral voters who are actually tend to lean more Republican and in particular are are relatively pro-Trump. And then, of course, there's the abortion issue, which there's no doubt about it, is been very helpful, again, particularly in these relatively low turnout elections. This is an an issue where the Republicans are clearly on the back foot. They have a really hard time dissociating themselves from flat out abortion bans. And the kind of voters who care about it a lot are especially likely to turn out in these elections. So it really is sort of the Democrats version of a successful culture war. It's really working well for them. And I, do, I want to come on to, obviously, again, in detail what you talk about in your book. But do you, do you agree then with the view, you know, I've heard this expressed from a number of Democrats whenever Joe Biden's poll numbers are brought up or whenever people express gloom for the Democrats about next year, they say essentially two things, abortion and Donald Trump or abortion and MAGA. And they're going to be enough to bring the Democrats home. Do you think that's right? I mean, again, we're going to, I know, as I say, we're going to get into detail in your book, but do you think that basic, pretty simplistic analysis is correct? I'd say my basic assessment of that simplistic analysis is, yeah, it's pretty simplistic and it's probably wrong. doesn't mean they won't win the next election, but the idea that you can just replicate 
election after election. There's sort of abortion, democracy, low turnout, relatively educated, democratic-oriented activist voters, and you'll never be bit by the fact that you have pretty poor support in the working class now writ large, I think is silly. Now, it doesn't mean that Democrats might not be able to make the political arithmetic work for them, and perhaps just barely in 2024. But I think the idea that the real tale of today's politics is told by these off-year elections, the polls are like irrelevant. I think that is silly. I'm sure if the polls were very much in their favor and they didn't, do well in this last election. They'd be saying exactly the reverse. But I think the polls are telling us something. They're providing us with a snapshot of what voters feel today and what they really care about. Just at the most obvious level, if you ask people, what's more important to you, social issues like abortion and democracy or economic issues like inflation and jobs and whatever, you get an overwhelming share of the electorate says they care more about the economic issues. And this is particularly true among some groups that Democrats need to mobilize in their favor, like working class voters, like young voters, like Hispanic voters. It's very clear that that's at least what they say they care the most about. So the more that's an election's about that and can be more about, say, Democratic extremism on cultural issues rather than Republican, I think that's when things become quite difficult for them. We saw in the Times poll, as we've seen in so many polls lately, and we've we've seen in recent election results, this essentially inverse performance among working class and college-educated voters. Democrats dominate college-educated voters by 10, 15, 20 points while losing working class voters overall, including all ethnicities, by 10, 15, 20 points. And that's a pretty strange uh, position to be in for the historic party of the working class. And that's kind of what we try to highlight in the book. This is a trend of long duration. It's been accentuated by the last 10 years where we've seen non-white working class voters start to bail out in the Democrats. And this now, to some extent, defines their party and puts a ceiling on their potential, their electoral coalition. But one more thing before we dig much deeper into that, which is another topical thing, which is the ferment we've seen in the party in the last few weeks over the war in the Middle East. Uh, and in particular, perhaps this sort of surprising, I think a lot of us have found it surprising level of support for the Palestinian cause, and even some would say for Hamas among younger people, but people who tend to be on the left and tend to be Democratic voters. Have you been surprised by that? I mean, what's going on there and, and how important is it for the Democratic Party? Well, it doesn't surprise me. And in fact, there's probably nothing wrong with larger sectors of the Democratic Party being sensitive to the Palestinian cause writ large and sort of care about their welfare as well as, well as those of Israelis. But maybe it's probably a good thing that uh, a lot of Democrats aren't willing just to take the pro, you know, Israel right or wrong line. But that's way different than showing any kind of tolerance whatsoever for the sort of terrible parts of the Palestinian movement, which are most of the organized groups, which obviously includes Hamas. That kind of terrorist incident is absolutely unacceptable. And Israel has a right to defend its security, obviously. And we've seen in the paper today from reporting, this is very intentional and a part of Hamas. They want to create a state of war. They wanted to create a situation where the Israelis counterattacked and killed a lot of people because that keeps their, their cause alive. So what's disturbing about the situation, as I say, is not that some Democrats would be worried about Palestinian casualties and worried about the Israeli occupation, but rather that they would advance tolerance toward the Palestinian sort of quote unquote liberation movement in its terrorist form. And they would quote slogans like from the river to the sea and, and, and various other slogans that are clearly predicated on wiping out the state of Israel. That is disturbing. And that is uh, definitely a real tendency among a lot of liberal, very liberal Democrats, young Democrats, that kind of tolerance. And I think that connects to the whole cluster of cultural issues we were talking about in our book around race and gender and crime and immigration, a lot of other things, where there's this sort of wokish worldview which melds all these different issues together into one big, massive social justice commitment. And one of those commitments now is kind of being walked into the Palestine situation where, you know, the Israelis are the whites and the Palestinians are the non-whites. They're the oppressed and uh, Israelis are the oppressors. And so it always has been. And as properly people on the right side of history uh, we have to take the side of the Palestinians against the Israelis. You and John Judas famously wrote a book 20 years ago called The Emerging Democratic Majority, which identified the demographic and other factors that were 
we saw soon saw, as you correctly predicted or said, that we're forming a significant and sort of embedded democratic majority. And now you've written a book called Where Have All the Democrats Gone? 20 years later. Now, the critique of that book or of the argument in your book might be, well, you know what? Joe Biden won the election in 2020 with the largest number of votes any candidate's ever received. The Democrats have won the popular vote in seven of the last eight presidential elections. Again, yeah, we're looking at some rough poll numbers right now. But looking at the recent record, what's the problem for Democrats? They seem to be doing perfectly well. Thank you. Well, it depends on your definition of perfectly well. I mean, clearly, the last series of elections where Democrats have prevailed, at least in part, like 2020, where, uh, remember, they did lose 12 House seats, and then they lost the House again and completely in 2022. These have been very closely contested elections, where, as John and I argue in the book, the parties have been in a teeter-totter, you know, ever since the sort of late part of the Obama term, you know, the second term. And Either party kind of wins, depending on their ability to highlight the extremism as the other side and put them on the wrong side of voters' preferences. But it's hard to look at the data about how people feel about the Democratic and Republican parties, how they vote, you know, sort of below the presidential level, even on the presidential level. I mean, we shouldn't forget that 2020 was extremely close and 2016 Trump did win. It's hard to look at the data and think there's one party that's liked and loved, and this other party that's disliked and hated. On the contrary, people feel very, especially working class voters, feel very dubious about both. And in fact, as as I was noting earlier, working class voters are now giving the party of the working class more negative ratings than they give uh, the party of Donald Trump. And that's quite significant. And again, puts a ceiling on their potential level of support. It doesn't mean that they can't win elections. It certainly doesn't mean they can't win the popular vote in a nationwide presidential contest, but it does, you know, limit their ability to dominate in the rest of the country because there are so many areas of the country, so many geographies in various different states, like basically rural, small town and exurban America, where they're almost not basically almost uncompetitive. And if that's the case, it makes it hard for you to develop a big majority in the House of Representatives. It makes it extremely hard for you to do anything but eke out a small majority in the Senate. You can't get anywhere close to 60 votes. And you don't really have a party that's embraced by the majority of the American people as being the party that represents the people against the powerful, common man and woman, the ordinary American, which is always where Democrats have done the best. So Democrats can look at the recent period of time and Hey, you know, uh, Biden won in 2020, won the popular vote by four points. You know, we've been greeting these off your elections. If they're happy with that, God bless them. But I don't think that's really where they want to be or where they need to go or the kind of party America needs. So what's gone wrong for taking your model of 20 years ago of the emerging Democratic majority, where you identified these key demographic groups in particular, a more and more highly educated electorate and a growing number, a growing share of minorities, particularly Hispanics, particularly and, and other things too. But these key Democratic constituents, exactly as you said, that seemed to sort of forecast the uh, the 2008, maybe 2012 presidential election results. But what's gone wrong? Is it that the party has allowed itself to be, with the growth of this highly educated section of the electorate, has allowed itself to be driven in a direction that towards that is led by those people, those voters, those activists, and away from what we might call more traditional democratic voters? Well, I think the simplest way to put it in terms of the underlying problem with our analysis of the emerging democratic majority is we did highlight ways in which the terrain of American politics was changing in a way that all else equal would advantage the Democrats, famously the rise of non-whites, the rise of professionals, the changes in the women's vote, the support for Democrats in the most dynamic post-industrial sections and metros of the country. That was all true. But we all predicated it on the idea that a lot of other things might remain pretty strong for the Democrats, at least in a relative sense. And the key there, of course, is the white working class vote. We were very particular in our book to point that out, that the white working class is an immense section of the electorate. Central in a lot of key states, Democrats will need to continue to win. And you ignore them at your peril, because if that starts going south even more than it already has, and when we wrote it in the early 2000s, this would completely upset the political arithmetic of this potential coalition. Therefore, Democrats needed to pay attention to that. But I think what happened in broad brush after that, 2008, they ignored the 2010 warning signs, 2012, Obama's victory. is like, this is the rising American electorate, the coalition of the ascendant. And those who are with us are the anointed. Those who are not with us, including these working class voters who don't seem too happy 
later for them, their history, they're part of the America of the past, we're the America of the future. And I think that was a phenomenal mistake. And I think the Democrats paid for it in 2016, where white working class voters in particular bailed out of them en masse, particularly in the Midwest, and they lost the election to Trump. And they still haven't come back. And now we've seen non-white working class voters join the party, as it were, moving away from the Democrats. And I think one thing that people didn't realize who read our book is that there's a reason why white working class voters might have been suspicious of the Democrats and need to be kept on board, besides the fact some of them, as a lot of Democrats like to believe, are, are racist and xenophobes. It has a lot to do with the Great Divide which we talk about in our new book that's opened up between the college educated and the working class all over the country and is particularly profound in areas based on research extraction and farming, small town, rural, exurban America. These are all areas that have been left behind by the economy that not only Republicans presided over, but Democrats as well through the 80s and 90s into Obama's terms and so on. There really wasn't a change in the economic equation that these kinds of voters, these working class voters, felt was tremendously in their interest. They didn't trust Democratic elites. Of course, they didn't trust Republican elites either. And that's where Donald Trump comes in. But sort of to add insult to injury, as it were, uh, we see in the 21st century, starting in, you know, during Obama's terms, I think, uh, Black Lives Matter was 2013, 2014. You see the rise of these sort of boutique cultural ideas coming out of the campus and taking over large sections of the democratic-oriented infrastructure, the nonprofits, the advocacy groups, the foundations, a lot of academia, a lot of the media. These things become not just things people talk about on campus, but ideas of white privilege and structural racism, of, that sex is sort of an optional <laughs> characteristic that you could select, you know, the whole gender ideology thing. We, we shouldn't be so concerned about public safety. It's really about the disparate impact that arresting criminals has immigration. We should be much more open and liberal at the border because everybody wants to come here and who can blame them and to discriminate against those people. Is that just another form of racism? All of those things, which would have been anathema to Democratic politicians 20 years ago, are now very much accepted in wide sways of the Democratic Party. And in fact, in some ways have hegemony and affect the party brand. And as I who's alluding to all those institutions within which those views are embedded, one way I think about it is the people who hold those very liberal, if not radical, cultural views could control the commanding heights of cultural production. And that has an effect on the country. It has an effect on the Democratic Party. It has an effect on its image. And it has an effect on working class voters who look at what Democrats seem to prioritize and care about, and even the language they use, and say, what the hell is going on? <laughs> That's not where I'm coming from. And I'm not really with the program. And I'm getting the impression that if I'm not, they look down on me and think I'm sort of contemptible or Immortally, as Hillary Clinton put it, a deplorable. We're going to take a short break there, but when we come back, we'll have more with Ray Teixeira on the future of the Democratic Party. Stay with us. You're listening to Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Don't forget, you can listen to the latest episode anytime on your smart speaker. Just say, play the Opinion Free Expression podcast. Now, back to Jerry Baker. I'm back with Rita Teixeira, a political scientist and author of a new book, Where Have All the Democrats Gone? And we're talking about what's gone wrong with the Democratic Party in the last few years. You talk about globalization. How important is the embrace of globalization, both in economic, but I suppose also one can talk about in political and kind of social terms, a relatively permissive approach to immigration, which now characterizes certainly the Democratic Party. How important has globalization been in the context of the Democrats losing the support of working class voters? I think it's been quite important. Again, we talk about this a lot in the first part of our book, The Great Divide, that whatever else one might say about some of the Democrats' trade deals and deregulation of the financial sector, the sort of footloose capital that was favored under a certain economic model of what would work best for the American economy and for the world, I think a lot of these voters did feel left behind uh, and really were affected by these economic trends. And they didn't see an alternative in the Democrats. And of course, the China shock in the early 2000s really accentuates that. And David Otter and his collaborators have done some good work showing just how direct the relationship was between the effects of the China shock and movement of a lot of working class voters in areas toward the Republicans. So I think it's the case that if you drill down and, you know, sort of different kinds of polling data, you don't find that voters are opposed to globalization per se, and you don't find them opposed to immigration per se. 
What they are opposed to is the ways in which it seems to read down to their sort of undercutting them and their, their way of life and their communities. And they're not happy about that. So globalization on some level would be okay with them if it, in fact, in, in a sense, they felt it included them. You know, they're not opposed to the world and they're not opposed to immigrants. They are opposed to something where they seem to, a burden is inflicted on them and they see other areas of the country, the bluish areas, the highly educated areas, the dynamic metros, they're moving ahead and we're moving behind and that sucks. So I think that is a real problem. One could argue about what the policy response to this would have been that would have worked best and the extent to which these bad effects could have been mitigated. But I don't think there's any question that it had a huge effect on a lot of these working class voters. And Trump very cleverly picked up on that and managed to get himself elected president, partly by blowing up what seemed to be the consensus in the Republican Party, which had a relatively uncritical attitude toward all these things. As a very interesting study of advertising in 2016 showed, he ran the policy-oriented campaign. And he talked a lot about issues having to do with trade and immigration maybe in broad terms that weren't specifically, you know, about specific policy programs, but he talked about it a lot. And Hillary Clinton mostly talked about in her ads how awful Donald Trump was. So that's interesting, and that tells you a lot about the salience of these issues. Democrats have lost ground, as we talk about, among the white working classes, just for all the reasons you've just been talking about. They've also, most strikingly, seem to be losing ground, quite significant ground now, among minority voters, particularly among Hispanics. But some of these latest polls, and again, I don't know what you make of them, but we've seen some really striking polls. Latino voters almost evenly split in some polls between support for Trump and Biden, Trump making advances among African-American voters. What's going on there? Well, I think voters are, in a sense, they're voting two things things that formally, you know, sort of had a different valence in the Democratic Party for them. One is they're voting their ideology. Most non-white voters, especially non-white working class voters, are moderate to conservative in orientation. They are not liberal. That's a, a minority within a minority. So these moderate to conservative voters, especially those who lean conservative, had been voting way above their ideology in terms of their partisan preference. I mean, we've seen enormous switches in how Hispanic conservatives voted in 2012 compared to today. It's like going from 60-30 Democratic to 60-30 Republican. So these are massive shifts. And we've seen attrition among moderate voters as well. And the second thing that's gone wrong for the Democrats among these voters is they're starting to lose faith that the Democrats really are the vehicle of economic uplift for them. And you see now the split between college-educated and working class Hispanics and blacks and so on in terms of how they feel about the Democrats and their economic stewardship. And it certainly wasn't helped by the fact that in raw economic terms, the way working class voters fared in the pre-pandemic years under Trump was actually much better than they fared uh, since Biden has been in office. And you know, obviously there are mitigating factors there for Biden, but reality is reality. <laughs> Wages and incomes went up pretty smartly during the first three years of the Trump administration, and they have not done so in the first three years of, of the Biden administration. And that inflation spike was a killer. I mean, working class voters especially hate inflation. So again, undercuts their sense that in addition to Democrats not seem to be my cultural wheelhouse anymore, I'm not sure I trust them on the economy as much as I used to. And I think that has something to do with the orientation of the Democratic Party. They've lost touch with these working class voters and what really concerns them. And that affects their policies and the way they conduct themselves. You talk a lot about there about kind of industrial policy, about maybe some restrictions on immigration tariffs. Tell us about that, because a lot of those policies don't necessarily seem very pro-growth. Yeah, that's that's a good question, Jerry. And uh, I've talked about this a lot in things I've written on my Substack, The Liberal Patriot, and we do allude to it in the book that in terms of the growth policy, such as it is, the industrial policy, John and I are supportive of the general idea of industrial policy. We think industrial policy has a long history in the United States, going back to the first American system. There's a role for government to play in cooperation with the private sector that can be quite important. Um, and there are, you know, resources need to be put behind that at times, if judiciously. I mean, the question I think we have about the Democrats' approach is so much of it seems to be organized around well, first of all, a lot of these subsidies and so on, they have no quid pro quo. That's a problem. There's no conditionality. To some extent, they're just handing out money. But beyond that, what are they handing out money for? They're handing out money for the transition to renewable energy. 
basically wind and solar batteries and really pushing electric vehicles. Is this really the future of the United States? Is this a growth program? I have real questions about that, and, and we discuss some of them in the book. I think there's all kinds of problems that are popping up now with reliance on wind and solar. Electric vehicles aren't quite the cure-all people thought. And perhaps the bets are being put down here on something that is not, in fact, a real pro-growth. What you want is a high productivity, high growth economy, because that makes it a lot easier for working class people to get ahead. To the extent you don't deliver that, I think you're failing them. And I think that energy as a master resource is something that Democrats need to be more attentive to, because what people really want is cheap, reliable and abundant energy. Working class voters don't care that much about the green transition per se, certainly as an ideological commitment, but they are interested in what I what I just mentioned. So it seems like there was just some recent polling that was done that showed, I think, a group called um, Blueprint. And one thing they highlighted is that one thing people feel very positively about is, you know, if they're informed that Democrats have done a lot to make more fossil fuels available in the United States. They've promoted oil and gas. They handed out permits. You know, basically, they've done that kind of thing. And that gets a very positive reaction from most voters. But does the Biden administration ever talk about it? No, because what they really seem to be committed to is wind and solar. And they apologize, as Biden did when he approved the Willow Project, that, oh, you know, I'm sorry I had to do this. You know, I didn't learn to do it. It's kind of like what he said. They were going to approve building a small portion of the wall in the southern border. It's like, oh, you know, they made me do it. It's a legal thing. I'm sorry about that. So he's constantly apologizing for things that are popular. And yet the administration is 150 percent behind things that aren't even that popular and have real economic questions around them in terms of whether they can deliver the kind of growth America needs. So we talk about it. I talk about it sometimes in things I've written as an abundance agenda. Other people call it supply side progressivism. I think that's got a lot of potential. And I think the Democrats would be better off figuring out a way to promote something that looks like that. Maybe we don't need green Democrats so much as we need abundant Democrats. On the second of your broad proposals, you talk about about the need for a truce and finding middle ground in the culture war. What does that mean exactly? Well, I think what that means is the Democrats have to uh, (laughs) gather their courage and dissociate themselves from elements of the party who are pushing all kinds of things that the median voter, particularly the working class voter, is completely uninterested in. They don't want to use this new vocabulary around race. They don't want gender ideology taught in the schools. They don't want to be told they have to give their pronouns. They care a lot about public safety. They think shoplifting should be illegal and enforced. They think violent criminals and the homeless psychotics should be off the streets. I mean, these are mainstream common sense positions that Democrats are afraid to embrace because of the blowback they're going to get in certain sectors of the party. Same thing goes for the issue of enforcing border security and cracking down on abuse of the asylum system. Again, extremely popular. A lot of Democrats included are for these things, but Democrats tread very, very lightly on these things because they're so afraid of getting attacked on social media, in the mainstream media, by all the groups, quote unquote, and the very liberal elements of their party. But our view on this is they're going to squawk anyway, and they're basically pushing stuff There's good and bad radicalism, right? There's some radicalism that might raise things and eventually become doable and popular and necessary. Like the ideas of the New Deal prior to the New Deal would have been considered radical, but they actually were important and they worked. Social security was once a radical idea, but I would not put these ideas about race and gender, about open borders, about sort of a do no harm, care more about the criminals than the victims approach to public safety. And of course, the ridiculous defund or abolish the police. These things are terrible ideas (laughs) and they'll never be popular. And Democrats should be completely unafraid of dissociating themselves from them and saying, hey, you know, we're the party of normie voters. We're the party of common sense. You know, we're against discrimination. We're for tolerance. We're against extremism of all kinds. But you've got your back on this stuff. But isn't that ship sailed, right? The party does seem to be at the sort of activist level, maybe not at the top leadership level, but nationally, but it seems to be in the grip of these people who've come out of uh, colleges with these uh, pretty radical ideas, as you say, about race and gender and identity. I mean, how does the party seize back that ground without fundamentally alienating this very large number of people who've been driving the party in that direction for the last 10 years or so? Well, the question is, how large is that group of people? It's been measured variously. 
by the more in common survey and by Pew is six to eight percent of voters. So most people who support the Democrats and most people even who consider themselves liberal, much less moderate to conservative, are not on board with this this kind of rhetoric, this kind of language, and these kinds of priorities and policy commitments. They're again much more moderate on all these things. So I think you're better off trying to appeal to people who have mainstream positions so you can bring along swing voters and people more in the middle and build your coalition. Then you should worry so much about people on the the far left who aren't going to like what you do and are going to squawk mercilessly about it. Well, let them squawk. The worst they can do, what are they going to do? Vote for Trump? You know, maybe some of them won't show up in a given election, but I think that's a bit of a paper tiger. I don't think most people are as animated by these issues, even people who say they care about them as the activist groups are, the people who are the loudest voices on this, the people who are <laughs> very active on, I guess we used to call it Twitter, now it's X. The Biden administration famously said in the run-up to 2020, Twitter is not real life. That's the mantra of our campaign. Well, unfortunately, they've forgotten that. It's still true. X is not real life. What these activists stand for is not real life. What's real life with what actual voters actually care about. And the fact of the matter is when you drill down to what they do care about, it's pretty mundane and it's pretty common sense. And Democrats should be aiming at that, not figuring out how to please their most activist and left elements. And again, Jerry, I think the way you do that is you just draw some lines. You aren't afraid to criticize the crazies in your own party. And then you see what happens. But eventually a reckoning will have to be held and lines will have to be drawn. Finally, I know you know, this is a book about Democrats and what's gone wrong with the Democrats, but it, as you speak, and as you talk, and as I read the book, it strikes me that essentially what a lot of what you're describing here is the kind of transformation of the Republican Party. And, and in some ways, you know, your prescription for the Democratic Party is to become more like the Republican Party. I mean, and especially with this interesting new movement in the Republican Party towards a sort of more populist economics. As you know, there's a you know, kind of increasingly strong strand there, you know, which Trump himself represents, but some of those kind of sort of populist senators and other people like J.D. Vance and Josh Hawley and others. Are we seeing, dare I be so cheeky as to say, are we actually seeing an emerging Republican majority? I wouldn't hold my breath on that one. I think that there are many influences on the Republican Party who are way stronger at this point than the J.D. Vance's and the Josh Hawley's. The so I agree. It's interesting that they're moving in this direction and they're saying uh, some things that are new and important about what the Republicans have to deal with and stand for, given that they're now in, in some ways more of a working class party than the Democrats. How are they going to deliver for their new constituents? But I think there's a lot of very, you know, there's sort of a lot of business elements who relate to the party you're interested in, a lot of very, very socially conservative people whose priorities, for example, around abortion and a lot of other things aren't consistent with that. And there is a sort of, again, call to the personality around Trump. Trump is obviously a populist, but is he an effective populist messenger for the kind of populism the Republican Party could build a very strong majority on? I don't think so. I think he's too crazy. He's too uncontrolled. He's too detested in too many parts of the country and too scary to a lot of voters. So they've got a long ways to go themselves. Our basic take on where we are now is it's a stalemate between the parties. There is neither an emerging Democratic nor Republican majority. There's, it's not an emerging stalemate. It's a stalemate we have. And interesting question is how long will that go on before one or the other party kind of makes a break for it and isolates the extremists in their ranks and takes a different approach? Right now, our bets are on the Democrats, but I absolutely don't rule out. It could come from the Republicans, too. Rhee to share. The book is Where Have All the Democrats Gone? Written by Rhee and John Judas. Thank you very much indeed for joining Free Expression. Hey, thanks, Jerry. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks very much indeed for joining us on Free Expression. Please join us again next week when we'll be exploring another of the big issues that are shaping our world. In the meantime, have a great week. and Thanks very much. Bye-bye.